Our afternoon session will now begin with a musical prelude. Thus, we invite you to find your seats and quietly enjoy the musical program. Miał powód Bóg, gdy chciał, gdyś prawdy ujrzał blask, gdy nie otaczał Cię już dłużej rok. Bóg widział te. Żyłeś mu w modlitwie szczęście. 
volte sembrava che ogni cosa fosse contro me mi sentivo diverso da tutti quelli intorno a me ma ora non ho dubbi che nelle prove c'era Dio con me adesso so che Dio è stato con me quando ero debole con me nei silenzi miei con me in quei giorni bui io confidavo in Lui per non arrendermi per non tornare indietro mai c'è già va sempre accanto a me mi guida nei sentieri suoi cammina insieme a me c'è già va sempre accanto a me la mano mia stringe nella sua e non la lascia mai ora che lo so posso dirlo anche a te che Dio è lì se ti sembrerà di non farcela lui ci sarà e ti sorreggerà Già va è lì con te quando sei debole, con te nei silenzi tuoi, con te in quei giorni bui. Confida sempre in Lui per non arrenderti, per non tornare indietro mai. C'è già va sempre accanto a noi. sempre accanto a noi camminerà con noi ci guiderà mostrandoci la via c'è già va sempre accanto a noi la mano lui ci afferrerà e non la lascerà è stato con quando ero debole, come nei silenzi miei, come in quei giorni bui. Io confidavo in Lui per non arrendermi, per non tornare indietro mai. C'è già va sempre accanto a noi, sempre. Sempre, sempre, c'è già va sempre accanto a noi, sempre, sempre. C'è già va sempre accanto a noi. Welcome to all in attendance. We invite you to stand and sing song number 28, entitled, Gaining Jehovah's Friendship. After this song, you may pause the program for your local prayer.
Please be seated. Does God Almighty take notice of you personally? Do your choices really affect him? We invite you to listen as Brother Lowell Taylor delivers the discourse, You Can Make God Rejoice. How? Step one, you fry the stew. Step two, parboil the rice. Then pour the stew, the meat or the chicken stock, a little water, a little curry powder, salt and pepper to taste, and allow to boil. Next, add the parboiled rice and make sure that the water level is at the same level with the rice. Cover the pot and allow it to cook until the rice is soft. Finally, fry or grill the chicken. So what am I describing? I'm describing the steps to make the dish that we all love so much, jollof rice. Now what if instead of using those steps and those ingredients, I substituted spaghetti for the rice and palm oil for the stew? Now I take the spaghetti and I cut it until each piece is about the size of a grain of rice and then mix in the palm oil with spices and then instead of grilling chicken, I grill fish. Now if you put the, both the bowls together, the real jollof and what I just described, from far off they may look the same, but will they taste the same? Hardly. Likewise, there may be many different recipes for happiness. Some people say that you can get to happiness by getting a good job and making a lot of money. Others say having family abroad brings happiness. And still others feel that having many children is the key to lasting happiness. But honestly, those things will not produce real and lasting happiness. Those things are like the spaghetti and palm oil. They may look like happiness from far away, but they don't even bring you close. This afternoon, we will show you the steps that produce real and lasting happiness. Now, here's the recipe. Number one, there's a creator who cares for us. Number two, you can draw close to him. Number three, the choices you make can make him rejoice. And making him rejoice, number four, brings real and lasting happiness. Now these steps lead to real and lasting happiness guaranteed. Other recipes for happiness may sound similar, but they're not the same. So let's start our recipe for happiness with step one. There is a creator who cares about you. You know, if you sit down to a good meal, like if you taste a jollof that is just incredible, or your favorite local soup, the first question you might ask is, this is so good. Who made this? Likewise, when we see a beautiful sunrise, a beautiful sunset, or when we go out on a dark night and see it's clear, but you can see all the stars, don't we ask the same question? Who made these things? Now the Bible answers that question, along with so many more. There is solid proof that the Bible comes from God and indicates that there is a creator who cares for you. Here are some of the proofs. For example, its advice always works, every time. Whether the advice is getting along with others, whether it's on money matters, or whether it's how to pray to be heard by God, 
The Bible's advice works. Another proof that shows the Bible is truly from God is that its prophecies always come true, without exception. Whether it's describing how the ancient city of Babylon would be conquered, or whether it's predicting that serious diseases would spread throughout the earth before the end of this system, its prophecies are always accurate, always correct. Now the same book that does all that also reveals that our Creator is keenly interested in each and every one of us as individuals. Now how intensely interested is He in each one of us? To find the answer, please pick up your Bibles and turn with me to the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 30. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 30. Here Jesus says, But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. So, God values us so much that He knows details about us that we don't even know about ourselves. We don't know how many hairs are on our head, although for some of our heads it's maybe a little easier to calculate than for others. But still, it's a detail he knows about us. It's clear that God created us to enjoy life. Now that's step one. Acknowledging that there is a creator that cares about us. Step two. We've seen he loves us. But step two is Acknowledging that we can draw close to God. Now, how do we know that that's the case? Please turn with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 17. And let's read together verse 27. Acts 17, 27. God's word says, So that they would seek God, if they might grope for him and really find him, although in fact he is not far off from each one of us. That last part is what we're going to focus on. God is not far off from each one of us. Now how do we know that this is true? The reason why we know is because God gives us information about himself that he wants us to know about him. For example, the first thing he does is he tells us his name. He tells us that his name is Jehovah. It's as if he's introducing himself to us. But God does much more than that. Let's find out what. Please turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32 and we'll read together verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 4. The rock, perfect is his activity, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness, who is never in unjust, righteous and upright is he. So what do we learn about God in this verse? Well, God himself is telling us his qualities. Did you notice what they were? He's perfect. He's just. All his ways are justice. He's faithful. He's righteous. And he's upright. So in one verse, we have a very complete picture of who God is. So the real question for you and I this afternoon is will we choose to come to know Jehovah? Nothing will affect our lives more than our decision to come to know God. Now is that a bit of an exaggeration? Judge for yourself. 
Please turn with me to the book of John chapter 17. And let's once again read the words of Jesus Christ. John 17. And let's read together verse 3. Jesus says, This means everlasting life. They're coming to know you, the only true God, and the one whom you sent, Jesus Christ. Did you notice what coming to know God, what drawing close to God will mean for us? Jesus himself said it would mean everlasting life, life without end. Now with that prospect before us, don't let anything stop you. Not your busy schedule, not the anxieties, the challenges, the problems you may have. Nothing should stop you from setting aside time for God, getting to know Him better. Let's illustrate how important that is. If you had not eaten for days, would you let anything stop you from taking food if it was offered to you? Well, of course not. In that case, nothing could be as important. Well, it's the same with coming to know Jehovah. There is nothing more important than that. So don't let anything stop you. But we can be honest. Some of us have real challenges. Some of us have obstacles in coming to know Jehovah. What should we do if that's our case? Let's find the answer together. Let's turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 7, and we'll read verses 7 and 8. Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8. Keep on asking, and it will be given you. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and it will be opened to you. For everyone asking receives, and everyone seeking finds. And to everyone knocking, it will be opened. Those two words, keep on, indicate continuous action. And you notice it was mentioned three times, which indicates intensity. So whatever problem we have, we continue asking God. We keep on asking. And the promise here is that it will happen, especially if we want to draw close to Jehovah in spite of the challenges and obstacles before us. We know that it's possible because Jehovah gives us all the information that we need so that we can draw close to him. So, so far we've got two steps. There's a creator who cares about us and we can draw close to him. What's the third step? Number three is making choices in our life that can make God's heart rejoice. Does God really care if we choose whether or not to draw close to him? The answer is yes. He does care. And when we make that choice to draw close to him, to enter into a relationship with him, we make him rejoice. Let's see that together. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 11. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 11. Now, this verse has been woven into this program from this morning until now. It's a key thought for us. 
Proverbs 27, 11. Be wise, my son, and make my heart rejoice so that I can make a reply to him who taunts me. What a privilege for us. We can actually make God happy. We can make his heart rejoice by the choices that we make. But what if we fail to trust him? Or what if we reject his guidance? Then how does God feel? To find the answer, please turn to Psalm 78. It's quite a different reaction. Psalm 78, and we'll read verses 40 and 41. Psalm 78, 40 and 41. How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and made him feel hurt in the desert. Again and again they put God to the test and they grieved the Holy One of Israel. So if we reject his guidance, how will God feel? Well, we can pain him. We can hurt his heart, make him sad. That's how deeply that Jehovah loves each and every one of us. Now, how does Jehovah react when we make that decision to draw close to him? What does he do? Let's read together. James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Here, God's word says to us, Therefore, subject yourselves to God, but oppose the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw close to God, and he will draw close to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you indecisive ones. So do you remember the question? Do you remember why we're reading the scripture? How does Jehovah react when we draw close to him? Well, his reaction is that he draws close to us. And he rejoices when that is our choice. Now the question that remains is, how do we do that? How do we draw close to God? It's a very good question. And if we don't know, we must ask. Just to illustrate, if you wanted to make jollof rice, but you don't know how to fry the stew, will you make jollof rice? No. You have to fry the stew. So you have to ask, because without it, jollof is not possible. So you have to ask someone who has made jollof and can instruct you how to put oil in the pot, slice the onions, the tomatoes, what seasoning to use, which pepper to use, and then you have to know that you must fry it until you can lift a portion with the frying spoon and the oil continues to boil. But you have to ask, otherwise it won't be jollof rice. In the same way, if we want to, to draw close to God and we want to make his heart rejoice, we have to ask, how? Well, here's the first step. We must read and carefully study God's Word, the Bible. Now that's the first step because this book contains God's thoughts. So if we want to draw close to God, a principal way we do that is by studying and reading the Bible each and every day. But what if you don't enjoy reading? You just don't like it. Well, if that's the case, 
First Peter chapter 2 and verse 2 says that we must form a longing for the word. Now, just to illustrate that, imagine a child who the parent wants him to eat vegetables. He wants him to eat the local soup, the vegetables, everything that's good. Now, all the child wants to eat is biscuits. But what happens over time? Over time, the child learns how to eat vegetables, how to enjoy good food, good soups, and good swallows. But it's over time. He forms a longing. The same with us. If reading is a challenge for us, we need to form a longing so that we can draw close to God. Another principal way we draw close to God is speaking to Him in prayer. Now, what does that do for us? Psalm 145 and verse 18 says, Jehovah is near to all those calling on Him. So prayer is essential. And not just thank Him for the food and for the day, but really pour our hearts out to Jehovah. Tell Him our most intimate thoughts, our anxieties, our fears, as well as our goals and what we want to accomplish. The last step in drawing close to God is applying His wise advice. When we see that we need to adjust something either in our thinking or in our actions, we need to apply it, then God can see that we truly want to come into a relationship with Him. Now, we've talked about all these steps. It's like we're making a recipe for happiness. So we talked about drawing close to God. We talked about, first of all, getting to know that there's a Creator who cares for us. Then we talked about that we can draw close to Jehovah. And finally, that we can make decisions that can make his heart rejoice. Now, if we do all those three steps, what have we just made? We have just produced happiness. For us to make God's heart rejoice makes us happy. And that's the real and lasting happiness that we spoke about in the beginning of this talk. So that's our fourth and final step. Now, how will you benefit? How will I benefit when we make our Heavenly Father rejoice? Again, we find true happiness. Please, turn to our final scripture in this discourse. James chapter 1 and verse 25. James 1. 25. But the one who peers into the perfect law that belongs to freedom and continues in it has become not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, and he will be happy in what he does. This is the genuine happiness. It's not emptiness. This fills us up with joy when we have a good relationship with Jehovah and we want to make his heart rejoice. And when we are genuinely happy, we are able to better cope with challenges and with pressures that this evil system throws at us. For example, when we make that decision, we will become part of a worldwide family that is united by love. There are no color borders. There are no ethnic borders. There are no language borders. We are truly one people, eager and ready to do whatever we need to do to help our spiritual brothers and sisters. Furthermore, we will feel 
the approval and care of our loving Heavenly Father, whom we can always depend on, no matter what we're going through, no matter, no matter what our circumstance is in life. The fact is this. There is only one basic way to make jollof rice. Following that recipe and using those ingredients will result in a good meal. But if we follow a bad recipe and substitute ingredients, that won't be a good meal. Just as following bad advice and setting goals that are not in harmony with God's will won't produce happiness, doing, making sure we draw close to God will produce happiness. Recognizing that there's a Creator who loves us, that we can draw close to, whose heart we can make rejoice, is the only true recipe for real and lasting happiness that exists. It is true. We can make Jehovah's heart rejoice by coming to know Him the only way to true and lasting happiness. Thank you, Brother Taylor, for explaining how we can come to know Jehovah and how we benefit by doing so. Now, let us stand and sing song number 35 entitled, Make Sure of the More Important Things. After the song, there will be an announcement, and if you wish, you may remain standing. Again, that's song number 35. <laughs> How we appreciate receiving a regular supply of spiritual food. Provisions such as this assembly reflect Jehovah's loving care for us. Those who would like to assist with covering the expenses involved in presenting this assembly may donate online at donate.jw.org. 
you may be seated. To please Jehovah, we must think carefully about the choices we make every day. What tests may arise, and how can we meet them successfully? Please pay careful attention to the talks and demonstrations in the following four-part symposium. Each speaker will introduce the one to follow. Brother Paul Ander will present the first talk. His theme is, Please Jehovah in your personal life. A young woman ran to meet her father. She was very happy to see him come back safely from a battle that he had gone to fight. His great victory made her dance and sing with joy. But what her father next did and said must have surprised her. He ripped his clothes apart and cried out, Oh no, my daughter, you have broken my heart. He then told her that he had made a promise to Jehovah, one that would utterly change her life forever. His promise meant that she would never marry and would not have any children of her own. But immediately, she made a beautiful reply, encouraging her father to keep his promise to Jehovah. Her answer showed that she fully trusted that whatever Jehovah asked her to do would be good. When her father saw her faith, he was very proud of his daughter because he knew that her willingness would make Jehovah happy. Jephthah and his daughter fully trusted in Jehovah and his way of doing things. They were faithful even though what they were asked to do was difficult. They wanted to have Jehovah's approval and for them that was worth any sacrifice. Today among Jehovah's people, we have many Jephthahs and Jephthah's daughters. I know that you're one of them. You see, Jehovah rejoices when we go on walking in the truth. He wants us to do things that will make his heart rejoice. However, we live in a world that is controlled by Satan. And so it comes as no surprise to us that the world does not encourage us to do things to please Jehovah. Rather, what we hear are things like, it's my life. No one tells me what to do. In view of these influences surrounding us, how can we bring Jehovah joy in our personal life in our family, in our congregation, and in our community? Would you like to know? That is what this symposium is about. This part of the symposium will dwell on pleasing Jehovah in our personal life. When it comes to making Jehovah happy, we have a wonderful example in the person of Jesus. Notice as Jesus expresses how he feels about his father in the Bible book of Mark chapter 14, verse 36. Mark chapter 14, verse 36. See how Jesus feels about his father. There the Bible tells us, Mark chapter 14, verse 36. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. You see, Jesus was concerned not about his own will, but the will of his father. Jesus pleased Jehovah by putting his father's will ahead of his own. But what was it that made Jesus to be willing to obey Jehovah even when it was difficult for him? The answer is found in John chapter 14 verse 31. John chapter 14 verse 31 tells us what helped Jesus to remain obedient to Jehovah even when it was difficult for him. If you are there in John chapter 14, we're going to read verse 31. There the Bible tells us. But for the world to know that I love the Father, I am doing just as the Father has commanded me to do. Get up, let us go from here. Did you notice from this verse what motivated Jesus to do as the Father commanded him to do? He said, I love the Father. I love the Father. Nothing else mattered more to Jesus than that. It was not that he was constantly repeating the expression, I love my father, I love my father. No. In fact, this verse is the only place in the Bible where Jesus expressed his love for his father so directly. Yet, Jesus lived those words. His love for Jehovah was evidence in his daily life. Jesus' courage, 
His obedience and his endurance were all evidence of his love for Jehovah. In fact, his entire ministry was motivated by love. So we see that Jesus obeyed God, not out of a sense of duty, but because of his deep love for Jehovah. No doubt we want to imitate Jesus. But the question is, how? How can we please Jehovah in our daily life? How can we ensure that our love for Jehovah is not just born out of a sense of duty, but because we really love him? You would recall that following Jesus' baptism, while he was in the wilderness, the devil tried to break his integrity by using temptations. Jesus had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, so we would expect that by this time he would be tired and hungry. He would have a strong desire to eat something. Then comes Satan who tells him, if you are a son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. Did Jesus take the bait? No. Instead, Jesus refused to make use of his God-given power for personal benefits, just what Satan wanted. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 4, that it is written, man must live not on bread alone, but on every utterance coming forth from Jehovah's mouth. Now, do you see what Satan was trying to do on this occasion? Satan was trying to exploit a natural desire that Jesus had at this time. Satan still tries to do the same to us today. He tries to exploit and twist our natural desires. He has done this with a desire for sexual intimacies. You see, rejecting Bible morality, many in the world today view sexual relations between unmarried people as legitimate pleasure or as a way of proving that they are adults. And what about those who are married? Many commit adultery. And even when there is no infidelity in their marriage, numerous individuals seek a way to to break free from the marriage. They seek divorce, they seek separation, just so that they can start living with someone else. Satan's subtle approach aims to influence people to live for pleasure now, inducing them to ignore the long-range effects of their conduct on themselves and others, but especially on their relationship with Jehovah and Jesus. But you see, even though Satan's world tries to defy Jehovah's arrangement for honorable marriage. Notice how Jesus countered this in his time as we read Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 to 6. See how Jesus countered what Satan's word was trying to do in his time. Matthew chapter 19, we're going to read verses 4 to 6. There the Bible tells us. In reply, he said, Have you not read that the one who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and will stick to his wife, and the two will be one flesh, so that they are no longer two but one flesh? Therefore, what God has yoked together, let no man put apart. We see Jesus restating the standard that Jehovah created back then in the Garden of Eden. Jesus did not allow the world to defy Jehovah's arrangement. Like Jesus, we must resist Satan's effort to try to undermine our moral principles. Another natural desire that Satan has sought to twist or to exploit is our natural desire for recreation. Who does not like downtime? You see, when wholesome, recreation can be physically, mentally, and emotionally refreshing. But how do we react when Satan tries to cleverly use occasions of relaxation to alienate our thinking from God? How do we mean? We know, for example, that Jehovah hates sexual immorality and violence. So what do we do when movies, television programs, theater performances feature these things that Jehovah hates? Do we passively sit and take it all in? The truth is that Satan will see to it that such things become more and more debased as the time for his destruction gets near. The scripture tells us in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, that wicked men and impostors will advance from bad to worse. So we constantly need to be on guard against Satan's designs to undermine our morality. Let your love for Jehovah motivate you to always do your best to please Jehovah, just like Jesus did. Rest assured that just as Jehovah helped Jesus, Jehovah will also provide whatever you need 
to stay spiritually strong. And this is exactly what Jehovah has done for us through his word, the Bible. So what must we do? We must make the effort to read the Bible, meditate, and pray. In fact, Bible reading, meditation, and prayer should be part of our daily routine. Now what this does for us is that it shifts our focus from our selfish desires to our relationship with Jehovah. As we have established, Satan's thinking can come to us in subtle ways. Now let's look in on it. Let's look in on a sister and her co-worker during break at work. See if you can identify how Satan is trying to exploit a natural desire. Emmy, I can't believe you and your boyfriend broke up. Yeah, Jen, it was such a difficult decision. But God is that such a great job. <laughs> yes, I know that. But that was actually part of the problem. Problem? Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Well, I finally realized that most of his joy comes from his work. Mm -hmm. He wants to focus on financial security instead mm -hmm. of doing more for Jehovah. Okay, Jehovah, I get your point now. Your religion is super important to you. That's right. I get it. But what's next? Are you interested in anyone now? I really haven't thought about it. Hey, Emmy, you better get to it before it's too late. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Uh, well, me, I'm keeping my eyes open now. Sure, I can say it like this. You're keeping your eyes open. But are you opening anyone else's eyes? <laughs> or is only your own? <laughs> As in, I, I don't understand. What do you mean? Okay, let me give you an example, Emmy. I saw your profile on social media. <gasps> it's so weak. See, you need to make your pictures more, you know, interesting. Interesting? You know what I mean. If you want to meet people, you need to show more. <laughs> Not just mm. landscapes and dress clothes. Oh, we see you like that. <laughs> mm. okay. See, look at the girls here at work now. I'm not saying you have to look like them, mm. but your selfies, how bad, even selfie. Your selfies can be more flattering. Anyway, for that one, I can help you pick some nails. Sure, I think we can do that now. Is this, mm. am I okay like this? Mm. And anyway, Amy, Amy, on a serious note, you need to be more active online. Come on, there are a bunch of ways to meet people. Go online, even Jehovah's Witnesses, you will meet them there, I tell you. Okay, I, I think I'll do that. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Wouldn't you agree that Emmy is getting bad advice from a well-meaning acquaintance? How could Emmy's love for Jehovah move her to do what pleases Jehovah in her personal life? Let's see how Emmy handles this. Emmy, I saw your profile on social media. <laughs> it's so weak. You've got to make your pictures more, you know? Interesting. Interesting. You know what I mean. If you want to meet people, you need to show more. <laughs> Not just landscapes and dress clothes. How we see you like that? <laughs> oh, Nobody. please. Come on, Jen. I think my dress clothes are very cute, hey. as you can see. Besides, what goes online stays there online. Mm -hmm. You can't delete it. I don't want to look back and be embarrassed by something I posted. <laughs> and me. Look at the girls here at work. I'm not saying you have to look like them. Okay. But your selfies, haba, <laughs> even selfie, your selfies can be more flattering. But wait, I can help you. Listen, listen. The only people I connect with online are my friends. And I think they already know what I look like. <laughs> Who am I flattering? Emmy, that is your main problem. That is the main problem. You see, you need to be more active online. There are a bunch of ways to meet people. Come on, even Jehovah's Witnesses. You hmm. will see them there, I tell you. Jen, Jen, Jen. I know people who have tried that. And I've seen how it turned out for them. Not well at all. I will not do that. Look, Jen, I really appreciate your concern, okay? But I'm very sure. I know that Jehovah is looking out for me. We are happy that Emmy allowed love for Jehovah to move her to do the right thing. We hope you will do the same. Today, our gratitude for spiritual light and truth is unchanged. Jehovah keeps providing us what we need. Indeed, now we have even greater reason to rejoice that we walk in the light of Jehovah. Following Jehovah in our personal life always brings true happiness.
Remember, Jehovah is teaching us to benefit ourselves. Because of his loyalty to God, Jehovah helped Jesus. Jehovah can help us too if we are loyal to him. In the video, young people ask, what will I do with my life? But a flysick told Andre, unless you use your life to serve Jehovah, you will always feel empty. None of us want to feel empty. So let us use our life to please Jehovah. When you use your life to serve Jehovah fully and honor him, you will be very happy. In the words of Psalm 37 verse 4, you will find exquisite delight in Jehovah and he will grant you the desires of your hearts. But at Amos Onyeka, we now present the next talk of this symposium, Please Jehovah in your family. How warmly they exchange glances and tenderly hold each other. Who can deny that they are deeply in love? These thoughts run through the mind of an elder who has just officiated in the couple's wedding. As the newlyweds move gracefully across the dance floor at the reception, the elder could not help but wonder, will their marriage stand the test of time? As the years go by, will their love deepen or will it take on wings and fly away? For marriages to thrive, they must be based on Bible principles. Jehovah will be involved in the relationship. Talking about this in the scriptures at Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12, the scripture says in part, a three-foot cord cannot quickly be torn apart. In this illustration, the first two cords are the husband and the wife. They must intertwine with the central cord, which is Jehovah God. How do they do this? by cultivating a personal, warm relationship with Jehovah God and taking delight in doing his will. That will bring happiness in the marriage. And at the end, Jehovah will be glorified because he is the one who instituted marriage. When Jehovah made the marriage arrangement, he wanted husband and wife to enjoy love in it. It's not just a mere formal arrangement, but love should reign in marriage. Love is better sense when it is expressed. So uh, couples do well to uh, avoid allowing daily anxieties or activities of life to rob them off of showing expressions of love to each other. Self-sacrificing love can also cement the bond of marriage. When couples or husband and wife display self-sacrificing acts to each other, it strengthened the marriage. And it shows that we value our marriage and that we want to preserve it. It is also nice and encouraged for husband and wife to listen to each other and accept suggestions. Family heads, please take your responsibility seriously. The Bible encourages you at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. And please join me in reading Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. I encourage you to turn to that scripture, please. Ephesians, we will read chapter 6, verse 4. Dear God's word says, And fathers, do not be irritating your children, but go on bringing them up in the discipline and admonition of Jehovah. The term, as used here, bring them up in the admonition of Jehovah, does not simply refer to impacting facts. It means you should appeal to your children. It is such a way that you move them to act. You need to teach your children to discern what is right from what is wrong. Mario, a father of two, recommends, give children lots of love and read to them. Have a Bible study with them. What a practical advice. As the head of the family, please use the family worship session to build your family relationship, to make it closer, and so that everyone will enjoy and have personal relationship with Jehovah God. What about you young ones and children in the family? Can you please Jehovah in your family? Certainly, yes. Of course, you are familiar with what Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 3 says. He encourages you to be obedient to your parents. 
But there is something else you should do, and that is uh, highlighted at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. There, the Bible wants you to flee from youthful desires. And what are some of these youthful desires? They include covetousness, competitive spirit, love of money, and uh, pursuits of material things, fornication too. These you are to flee from. But the same Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, encourages that you pursue righteousness, love, faith, peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a clean conscience. So when you young ones and children in the family willingly support the family arrangement, there are bound to be peace and unity in the family. When you willingly engage in the ministry with the family, willingly uh, attend Christian meetings and support the family worship arrangement, participate in it, the family, your dad and your mom will be happy and ultimately you will make Jehovah's heart glad. And speaking about family worship, please let us look in on a family on their family worship evening. Please watch. What a day. Sweetie, are you up to doing family worship tonight? Ah, honey, not tonight. You know, I've been working on my public talk all night this week. And besides, I didn't prepare anything particular for our family worship. And as you can see, I'm exhausted. I know what you mean. I'm tired too. Maybe we could just postpone it for a week. Have you ever had a week like that? Where you thought you were not as prepared as you would have loved to? It can happen from time to time. But please, what could this father do? I encourage you to watch again. You know, at least we can do this week Bible reading and discuss it together. Hmm, that would be nice. Come on, Nancy and Chinidu, please bring your Bibles. Dad, how about building a model of the temple? Wow. That's a fascinating idea. But how do we know how the, the temple looked like? It's described in the Bible, and there are pictures of it in the appendix and in the inside books. Wow, that's lovely. It does its gain in preparation for our next family worship. You can come up with a picture you can work from. Then add as many measurements as possible as you can. Maybe during our next family worship, we can start building. But Chinedu, this night, we can start with our Bible reading. OK, that's cool. Oh, the Bible reading this week is about Mary. She's one of my favorite Bible characters. Wow. Kids, honey, let's start with prayer. Why is family worship arrangement so important? Something that should not be missed in this time of the end. To illustrate, the congregation could be likened to a house made of bricks. And a well-built brick house consists of two main components. One, the solid foundation. And two, the durability of the individual bricks. If the foundation is weak, the house will collapse. But if the foundation is strong, and then the individual bricks begins to crumble, the house will be unsafe to live in. What is the point? The Christian congregation is built on the best foundation imaginable, which is the teachings of the Christ. Individuals and families in the, in the congregation are like the bricks 
family worship section provide a unique and excellent opportunity for individuals and families to build and maintain fire-resistant faith. And we know when a, an individual is strong and a family is strong, it results in a strong congregation. So as family heads and family in generally, doing something for your family worship evening is better than doing nothing at all. Do not quickly give up on your family worship evening when you feel you did not do as much as uh, you would have loved to do. Jehovah sees and values your sincere efforts in making sure that you maintain and conduct meaningful and upbuilding family worship evening. What benefits results when family please Jehovah together? The benefits or blessings are many. Let's consider just few. When family please Jehovah together, the family relationship will improve. There will be peace, unity, and security in the family. Everyone will love to return to a happy family. That is a good or fine benefit that comes from serving Jehovah unitedly together. Uh, there is another benefit I would like you parents to read about. Uh, third John, third John verse four. I encourage you please to open your Bibles to 3 John. I will read verse 4. 3 John 4 says, No greater joy do I have than this, that I should hear that my children go on walking in the truth. Mature Christians in the congregation usually rejoice when they see younger members of the congregation go on walking in the truth, as the scripture says here. But when you parents see your children go on walking in the truth, when you hear that they are doing well wherever they are, you see them doing well when they are with you, and you keep hearing their progress in the truth, your joy is incomparable. That is a big and huge benefit for every family. And what is more, the biggest benefit, when families individually play their role, they will receive smile of approval from Jehovah God. No other blessing can be compared to this. Brother Ogorowe Ilori will now present the next talk of this symposium. Please Jehovah in your congregation. How do we feel about being part of Jehovah's congregation? No doubt we feel happy and thankful we share the feelings of the psalmist expressed at Psalm 35, verse 18. Please open to Psalm 35, verse 18, and see what the psalmist David said under inspiration. So how he felt, feelings that no doubt you and I share. Psalm 35, verse 18, there we read, Then I will give thanks to you in the great congregation. I will praise you among the throngs of people. Yes, we are moved to praise Jehovah, to thank him for being part of the congregation. And it gets better. Because being in the Christian congregation makes us a part of Jehovah's universal organization. Now, the previous speaker spoke about the family arrangement. You know that this was established by Jehovah. Similarly, the Christian congregation was established by Jehovah. And so we please Jehovah when we follow direction that he gives us in the congregation. Think about a family where the parents perhaps are about to go out and the children are going to be home. What would they usually do? They would assign somebody, perhaps one of the older children or a relative, to look after the children. When the parents go out, that one who's looking after the children may say to them, if you don't do this right, I will tell mommy or daddy. Or the children themselves will tell that one, if, I will tell mommy or tell daddy for you. Why? Because they recognize who has made the arrangement. In a similar way, Jehovah wants us to cooperate with the arrangement that he has put in place. Let's see how this is expressed for us in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17. Hebrews chapter 13, we're looking at verse 17. There God's word exhorts us. Be obedient to those who are taking the lead among you and be submissive. Yes, Jehovah wants us to obey the direction he's providing. And he provides his direction through the governing body, through secular overseers and through the elders. Being obedient in this sense means obeying because we are persuaded to believe, not just out of a sense of duty. 
But there may be times when we do not understand the reason for a direction that is provided, or we do not feel inclined to agree with it. In that case, what should we do? The verse says we should be submissive. Why should we do this? For they are keeping watch over you as those who will render an account. Yes, the elders will render an account to Jehovah. So will we as to how we responded to the direction he gave us through them. And when we do this then, they will keep watch over us with joy, not with sign. And most importantly, Jehovah will be pleased with us. But what about the elders themselves? Well, look at that verse 17 again. Be obedient, it says. Does it limit it to those who are not elders? No. Both elders and all who are also not elders need to be obedient and be submissive. So elders set a good example by also personally following direction. For this reason then, congregation elders will not set aside direction from Jehovah's organization and do things their own way according to their own procedure or preferences, but rather they set this fine example. And it's important that elders do this because, as 2 Corinthians 1.24 reminds us, we're not masters over the faith of our brothers, we are fellow workers for your joy. So elders will become closer to the family, to the congregation. They will gain the love and respect of the congregation as they do this. Also, because the attitude that elders have towards the congregation is expressed very nicely in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8. Then the Apostle Paul, first century overseer, spoke of being gentle like a nursing mother, tenderly caring for her own child. That's really a touching scene to see, isn't it? A nursing mother looking after her child. And so elders have similar tender affection for the brothers. And isn't it true, brothers, that when you walk together with somebody closely, you tend to draw closer to the person, not somebody who stands aloof, afar, like a boss just looking on as if what you're doing does not apply to him. So elders are fellow workers for our joy, and they have tender affection for us. So indeed, all of us can please Jehovah in the congregation by submitting to direction. We can also please Jehovah by showing love and promoting peace. Why is this important? Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 to 3 paints a beautiful word picture that I would like to look at. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 to 3. The picture that is painted here is like a building. A building needs pillars to stand. As we read verse 2, look at the pillars that help the Christian congregation to stand. With all humility and mildness, with patience, putting up with one another in love. So we have humility, mildness, patience, and love. And we can say that love is a central or key pillar to helping the congregation stand. But just having strong pillars alone will not allow a house to keep standing. It needs something else. It needs regular maintenance. Does that apply in the Christian congregation? Please look at verse 3 of Ephesians chapter 4. Earnestly endeavoring to maintain the oneness of the Spirit in the uniting bond of peace. Yes, by promoting peace, we are contributing to maintaining the uniting bond, the oneness of the Spirit that exists in the congregation, and we make Jehovah happy. But sometimes, maintenance may involve reporting faults or leaks. For example, at Bethel, there is a maintenance department. If Somebody notices something that needs to be fixed. He needs to inform the brothers who can take care of it. So there's a leak in the tap or something. Or perhaps in our own houses. If the roof is leaking, for example, we might inform the head of the house or whoever else can take care of matters. The same is true in the congregation. If we become aware of serious wrongdoing, we need to report it. Not to spread it, but we need to report it to those who are in a position to do something about it. And we have a scriptural example of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where a report was made to Paul about a case of immorality in the congregation in Corinth. We do not know from the scriptures who made that report, but Paul had the authority to do something about it, and he did. After making such a report, we also want to support whatever decision those assigned to handle those matters come to. In the case of the immoral wrongdoer in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we know that he had to be disfellowshipped to keep the congregation clean. And it may sometimes happen that way, that one, an unrepentant wrongdoer may have to be disfellowshipped. If that happens, 
we also need to support the decision of the elders to disfellowship that unrepentant wrongdoer. This may not be easy if he is a close friend or a family member, but by supporting the decision of the elders, we are helping to maintain the cleanness of the congregation, and we may very well move that person to repent and seek Jehovah's forgiveness. And most importantly, will be pleasing Jehovah in the congregation. Indeed, as we follow direction from Jehovah, and as we contribute to maintaining the congregation by showing love and promoting peace, we make Jehovah happy, and we contribute to the welfare of the congregation. And we also benefit. So how do we benefit? How does it benefit us when we follow direction? Well, let's hear from Brother Charles Okubeku, a long-time elder who has been serving as an elder for over 25 years now. Brother Okubeku, you're welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Please, what evidence have you seen that Jehovah is guiding and directing the congregation? There are very many, but I'll mention just two. One is in the use of technology. About a decade ago, congregations were encouraged to open a JW account. Although this was not easy at first, despite the challenges, congregations complied. And now it is very easier and faster for congregations to receive information from the organization. Directions that are coming from the branch office is very easily received. Now, who could have known two years ago that it would be very beneficial at this, uh, the, during the time of the lockdown for them to receive information so quickly. The second area is uh, the contact information. You know, publishers were encouraged to give their contact information to the elders. With world conditions getting worse and terrible things happening every now and then, the contact information with the elders has proved to, to be very helpful. Very true. Thank you very much. But what good results have you seen when those in the congregation respond positively to direction? Well, it's very easy to see. Despite the lockdown during the pandemic, important and very uh, life-saving information were reaching the congregations very quickly. And so brothers know what to do. Brothers can even go online and then download the publications as, as soon as they come. And so the brothers, the congregations were kept united. Elders could even link congregations to uh, the, the meetings online, and so no one is isolated. They all receive encouragement. Thank you very much. And what other benefits? Now, talking about the contact information, it made it very possible for elders to reach uh, the publishers quickly when there are crises. Like during the lockdown also, Despite that the people movement is restricted, brothers are still receiving information from the organization. Elders are in contact with uh, uh, the publishers who are in need. And so this has proved to be nothing but Jehovah's hand. Very true. Thank you very much. Please continue to follow direction and carry on your faithful service. Thank you very much. So we have seen very clearly that there are many benefits that come from pleasing Jehovah by submitting to direction in the congregation. Indeed, when we cooperate with congregation arrangements, it always works out for the greatest good. We will enjoy unity, peace, and joy. And that's the thought conveyed in Ephesians chapter 4. Again, after manifesting the qualities that serve as pillars, humility, mildness, patience, and especially love, as we promote peace to help to maintain the congregation. Look at the result in verse 16 of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. From him, all the body is harmoniously joined together and made to cooperate through every joint that gives what is needed. Then note this, when each respective member functions properly, this contributes to the growth of the body as it builds itself up in love. Yes, the congregation will continue to be built up in love and all of us, will benefit and be built up and will produce the fruit of righteousness, will be pleasing to Jehovah, will bring praise to Jehovah. So please, let us continue to please Jehovah in our congregations. Brother Oluwashon Olokwade will now present the final talk of this symposium, Please Jehovah in Your Community. One additional aspect of our life where we all desire to please Jehovah is in our community. 
But the question is, how can we please Jehovah in our community? The Bible book of Acts chapter 13 verse 47 gives us the answer in no uncertain terms. Brothers, please take your Bible if you would and let us read Acts 13 47. There the Bible says, For Jehovah has commanded us in these words, I have appointed you as a light of nations for you to be a salvation to the ends of the earth. Did you notice Jehovah's clear and loving command we all must obey if we want to please Jehovah? He has given us a commission which is to serve as a light of the nations. Therefore, in this talk, we are going to examine this very closely and see how can we fulfill this commission, which is basically in two ways. One, that is by means of our preaching work. And two, that is by means of our conduct within the community. And lastly, we examine some amazing blessings, benefits that result if we make efforts to please Jehovah in our community. Why can we say that one way of functioning as light in our community in order to please Jehovah is by means of our preaching activities? Well, let us consider the, a particular aspect of Jesus' life that is recorded in the book of Matthew chapter 4 from verse 13 to 17. As we take a few excerpts from this portion of the Bible, where we identify Jesus' community. If you look at verse 13, you will see that Jesus took up residence in Capernaum, and which was in the district of Zebulon and Naphtali. The next thing, what was the condition like for the people living in Jesus' community? If you look at verse 16 of Matthew chapter 4, the Bible says that the people sitting in darkness and if you look a little lower in that verse 16, it says they were in a region of deadly shadow. The study notes helps us to understand that another expression we can use for deadly shadow is that they were living in the shadow of death. But then, what changed? How did Jesus' activity, his function as a light, brought about a change? What did he do? Look at verse 17. From that time on, Jesus began preaching and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of the heavens has drawn near. Brothers, can you connect the dot? The people in Jesus' community were described to be in darkness. In fact, a region of deadly shadow. However, when Jesus began his preaching activity, look at what verse 16 now says. The people sitting in darkness saw a great light. It was by means of Jesus' preaching work that he pleased Jehovah by taking the people in his community away from the shadow of death, bringing them into a region of light that Jehovah has provided. What's the point? Jesus pleased Jehovah by means of his preaching activity. And that's exactly what we all want to do as servants of Jehovah. And on this note, we want to commend you, brothers and sisters, because we know you love the ministry. We know you love preaching from house to house. You love to return to people that showed interest. You want to establish Bible study, return to them, and continue to conduct this progressive Bible study. But we know that our recent experience has shown that it is not always that we can have this opportunity. It may be because of a global pandemic. It may be because of a local epidemic. It might also be because of civil unrest or even religious persecution that we may not be able to go out and preach from house to house. Therefore, does that mean that we want to stop shining, fulfilling the commission given to us by Jehovah? Nothing should stop us. We have come to see that we can be very effective using alternative forms of witnessing trying to turn every ordinary, everyday conversation into an opportunity to give a wonderful witness. So where else can be our community to preach? It could be when we are traveling, if the circumstance in our community allows us to travel. It shows our fellow travelers becomes our community. Let us look for opportunity to preach. Is it now safe to go back to school in your area? 
your fellow classmates, your teachers now become your new preaching territory. Shine as illuminators. And as we do this, you will not only be pleasing Jehovah by means of your preaching activities, that decision to preach will make Jehovah happy. But in addition to that, you will also be helping others to come and learn more about Jehovah. My brothers, the truth is, it is not only our preaching work that can make Jehovah happy. There is another complementary activity, and that is our conduct. Jesus Christ clearly mentioned in the book of Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, that when people perceive our works, our activities, in other words, our conduct, they will be moved to give glory to Jehovah. And talking about this, brothers, let us listen to a brother who has been involved in construction activities for a number of years. Let us hear from him to know how his activities has allowed him to see opportunity people have, Jehovah's Witnesses as a whole, to praise Jehovah by means of our conduct. At this point, let us listen to an interview that will show the truthfulness of this fundamental truth. Uh, Brother Moses Ugbenu, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the program. Thank you, Brother Alokwadi. I am aware that you have shared in theocratic construction project for a number of years. Please, can you tell us how this work affected the community's view of Jehovah's Witnesses and our message? Every theocratic construction project always results in an opportunity to praise Jehovah in the community. Let me tell you an experience. There is this community in the northern part of the country where witnesses are viewed as nothing because of their humble lifestyle. In the past, the brother used to meet in a school classroom for their congregation meetings. And this gave the community more opportunity to mock and ridicule them for years. But Jehovah turned the situation around when the brothers have the opportunity to be their own kingdom hall. At the beginning of the project, the community began to verbally and visibly mocking the brothers, believing that sooner or later the project will be abandoned, just like every other religious project around them. Really? But were they correct? Not at all. They were completely wrong. Because in a matter of weeks, the building was already standing, moving towards its completion. But the speed was not their biggest surprise. So what was it? It was the conduct of the brothers and sisters working on the site. There was no fight, no abusive word. The environment was calm and peaceful. It was strange to them. Oh, really? But what effect did that have on them? From that moment on, their view about the witnesses in the, com- in the community changed positively. In fact, on another similar project, when a hired laborer saw how brothers and sisters are working together with him on site, he was so impressed so much that he began to study the Bible. Before the end of the project, he was already attending the meetings. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing such an encouraging experience with us. Thank you, Brother Moses. Brothers, did you notice from the experience that the people observed the conduct of Jehovah's Witnesses during the construction activity? What actually moved them the most was not just the speed of the construction, but it was actually the con- godly conduct. No abusive expressions, no fighting, no horseplay. But then the question is, are you able to identify why we have such a benefit resulting from the construction activities and people's godly conduct? Please let's take our Bible and open to the book of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. And as we read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, please try and see if you can see why we have such an amazing result. Verse 12 says, Maintain your conduct fine among the nations, so that when they accuse you of being wrongdoers, they may be eyewitnesses of your fine works, and as a result, glorify God in the day of his inspection. Let's put this portion of the Bible into perspective. It is not just because we preach that we make people praise Jehovah if our conduct is not in compliance with what we preach. Let me tell you a brief experience of a sister who was working in a company. 
In that same company, we had a migrant worker who was also working there. But because of his very small stature, people always ridicule him from day to day, except our sister. One day, the man walked up to our sister and asked, why are you so different? Why don't you ridicule me like every other person? The sister saw that as a wonderful opportunity to give a witness. And you know what the man did? The man accepted Bible study. After accepting Bible study, he progressed to the point of getting baptized. But that's not the end of the experience. When the man eventually returned to his homeland, people saw that he was a changed man. They were so impressed with his godly conduct, and as a result, they accepted Bible study too, and they were progressing. What made it happen? Was it not because the sister decided not to join others, but to manifest godly qualities in her life, which led to giving a powerful witness, and then leading to assisting this man to see the light coming from Jehovah? taking him away from spiritual darkness. There is another benefit that results from our fine conduct, as we see in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. When people accuse us wrongly and others perceive our godly conduct, we give these people opportunity to disprove the unfair criticism levied against Jehovah's servant. And maybe there is no other experience that can better illustrate it, this than what happened to our brothers in Germany. You know, the location where Germany Bethel was, people really did not like Jehovah's Witnesses. And they began to ridicule Jehovah's Witnesses. But when the news got to the mayor's attention, a mayor is more like a local government chairman. The, lawyer, the mayor admitted that, well, it is true, those people living in that facility, in better facility, they have a different way of life. But their different way of life certainly does not hurt anybody. Do you think that if our brothers have been doing something bad, would the mayor have had the opportunity to defend them and protect them from further harassment? Certainly not. We can then see that many benefits result from pleasing Jehovah in our community when, when we take our preaching activities seriously and when we use our conduct to glorify Jehovah. And as we do this, everyone that takes the opportunity to listen to us will also be saved. What have we learned so far? In the course of this symposium, we have learned that it is very important to please Jehovah in our personal life. It is equally important to use our family life to please Jehovah in our congregation, and now we have just discussed in our community. If we do this, we will actually be fulfilling the purpose for which we were made. And what's the purpose? Do not forget that the account of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, says that the conclusion of the matter, everything having been heard is that we should fear the true God and keep his commandments. For this is the entire obligation of man. Brothers, it is true that when we make effort to please Jehovah, we will truly also be happy. Now let us consider our review question. How can we please Jehovah in all aspects of our life? The answer, John 14, 31, Ephesians 6, 1 to 4, Psalm 35, verse 18, and 1 Peter 2, 12. Jehovah is pleased when our decisions and actions show we are eager to follow his guidance in everything we do. Let us, therefore, allow Jehovah to guide our steps every day. Let us strive to gain Jehovah's approval in everything we do. And as we do this, will we gain our blessings right now, and it's going to be the key to eternal happiness. Thank you, brothers, and your participants for that fortifying symposium. We now have now come to the concluding talk of this assembly. All day long, we have been discussing how we can make Jehovah rejoice. Why is doing so the key to our own joy? Please give your attention to Brother Lowell Taylor as he concludes our assembly with the talk, 
The joy of Jehovah is your strength. Cities in ancient times were protected by walls. Now, in many cases, these walls were quite strong and very wide. The stronger the wall, the more difficult it was for an enemy to break through it and to attack the city. Now, please imagine a city with a big, strong wall being attacked by an army. The enemy is using everything available to try to break down that wall. But the wall stands firm. Imagine the joy and relief of the people inside the city that their wall held firmly. In many ways, that's like the joy we have in serving Jehovah. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But even more important than you and I having joy is that we have the privilege to bring joy to Jehovah. Please take your copies of the Bible and let's read together Proverbs chapter 23 verses 15 and 16. Proverbs 23, 15 and 16. My son, if your heart becomes wise, then my own heart will rejoice. My innermost being will find joy when your lips speak what is right. Now that can be us. We can bring great pleasure to Jehovah's heart, make it rejoice. And did you notice what it said? It says that when our lips speak what's right, his innermost being will find joy. What an amazing privilege for us. But just like in our illustration, there are pressures and anxieties and challenges that are trying to break down our wall. Satan wants us to give up and to give in. He wants us to let down our defenses. He wants us to become discouraged, discouraged by persecution, discouraged by disappointment discouraged by illness or by other trials, financial, economic troubles, or other things that come against us. However, the joy we get from pleasing Jehovah is like a protective wall for us. Now we understand how a real wall works as a protection. But the question is, how does the joy of Jehovah act as a wall and protect and safeguard us? Let's illustrate how God-given joy can help you and I to cope with discouragement. Now to illustrate, think back to the time of Nehemiah. Now, after Jerusalem's wall was successfully rebuilt, what did the people do? Let's pick up the account at Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 2. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 2. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. So Jehovah's law was read and explained to everyone who could understand, men, women, and children. Now, how did the people react to the law? Let's take verse 9. And Nehemiah, who was then the governor, 
Ezra, the priest and copyist, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to all the people, this day is holy to Jehovah your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping as they heard the words of the law. Now why were they crying? Because they realized they had sinned against Jehovah and they were discouraged. Would they be overcome with sadness? Let's find out. Please listen to the encouraging words of Ezra and Nehemiah from the drama, The Joy of Jehovah is Your Stronghold, that we heard at our 2020 regional convention. Please listen. Do not mourn or weep. Now that you know what displeases God, you can do what pleases Him. So go, eat the choice things, and drink what is sweet, and send portion to those who have nothing. And do not feel sad, for the joy of Jehovah is your stronghold. What did Nehemiah want the Israelites to focus on? Do you remember what you heard? Let's read it right from the Bible. Please, let's read Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10. He said to them, Go, eat the choice things, and drink what is sweet, and send portions of food to those who have nothing prepared, for this day is holy to our Lord, and do not feel sad, for the joy of Jehovah is your stronghold. Now, what exactly is a stronghold? A stronghold is a fortified place, a place that has been strengthened. So it is a place of security. Now think back to our introduction. We said that there was a big, strong wall around the city. That wall acted as a protection against attack. That would be a stronghold. Now, talking about the joy of Jehovah being our stronghold, in the case of the Israelites, instead of being sad about their past sins, they had the joy of Jehovah as their stronghold, and so they gathered strength for his worship and service. That expression, joy of Jehovah, refers to the joy that only Jehovah can give us. Now that joy is an unfailing stronghold. It is a fortified or a strengthened place for us. Now that doesn't matter what our circumstances are. It doesn't matter if we're young or old. It doesn't matter if we have favorable circumstances or unfavorable circumstances. When we look to Jehovah while we undergo challenges, what will be the result? And this is a guarantee because it comes right from God's word, the Bible. Let's read it together. Please turn to Psalm 18 and we'll read together verses 1 and 2. Psalm 18, verses 1 and 2. God's word says, I have affection for you, O Jehovah, my strength. Jehovah is my crag and my stronghold and the one who rescues me. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and my horn of salvation, my secure refuge. Now these are wonderful words, saying that Jehovah is our strength, our crag, our stronghold who rescues us. It likens Jehovah to our shield, something of protection for us, and a secure refuge. 
But the question is, how do we do that? How do we make Jehovah our secure refuge, our stronghold? Look at the answer at verse 22. All his judgments are before me. I will not disregard his statutes. So we pay attention when we read things that God says. When we read in his word the Bible, when we need to make an adjustment, we adjust. We conform to what God wants. We want to seek to do his will no matter what our circumstance is. Now, if we sincerely do that, he will enable us to endure no matter what challenge we may face. For example, let's read together, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. God's word says, However, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the power beyond what is normal may be God's and not from us. Have you ever really thought about that scripture? I mean, really thought about it, meditated? When it says beyond what is normal, it means something extraordinary, something surpassing. Now, only Jehovah can give that to us. Only Jehovah can give us that power. Now, what that means is that when we're enduring very challenging circumstances, whether it's a sickness, whether it's we're dealing with old age, whether we're dealing with the coronavirus, whatever it may be, it means that Jehovah himself gives us what we need in order to endure. Jehovah himself gives us what we need. That is an amazing thought, that he loves us so deeply and he's interested in us so much that he will give this Spirit to us, this Holy Spirit, so that we can endure the challenges we're facing. So despite the trials and the difficulties that we face right now, we know that Jehovah sees our efforts to serve him and support us. Now throughout the course of today, through all the talks that we've heard, through all the demonstrations and interviews that we've enjoyed, Today, we have built a stronghold. That's what this program has done for us. We have built a wall that protects us from giving up and giving in. It allows us to stand firm. Even though Satan is pounding against this wall that we have built, trying desperately to get in, our wall stands firm. We are protected. Now let's go through the elements that make up our wall. Our program today has helped us to make that wall block by block. And as it explains how we can bring joy to Jehovah's heart. Now the foundation to our wall was laid this morning when we saw that we can give Jehovah our loyalty and our worship, and we have the privilege of making his heart rejoice, the greatest privilege any human could enjoy. Our first symposium this morning was the first layer of strong bricks. We can imitate Jesus and make Jehovah's heart rejoice by reflecting on four of Jehovah's qualities. Do you recall what they are? They're his justice, his use of power, his wisdom, and his love. In other words, everything we do when we imitate Jesus, 
we make Jehovah's heart rejoice. We also learned this morning how we can bring joy to Jehovah's heart in our ministry as we display fine qualities like Jesus and work hard to be as effective as possible even when we can't go house to house or make return visits or visit our Bible studies the way we'd like, even when we do alternative witnessing through phone or through some kind of social media platform, when we contact people, we still are doing what Jesus has asked us to do. And that means Jehovah's heart is rejoicing. Now our second layer of strong block was laid just this afternoon. We learned in the public talk that we can only find true and lasting happiness by coming to know Jehovah, that we can draw close to him, that we can truly make his heart rejoice, and this results in happiness for us. Now, other pursuits may look like happiness, but those pursuits only result in disappointment and emptiness. We also learned that we can please Jehovah in all aspects of our life, in our personal life, in our family life, in the congregation, and in the community. When our decisions and actions show that we are eager to follow his guidance in everything we do, we have the joy of Jehovah as our stronghold. Bringing joy to Jehovah's heart is a protective wall against, again, giving up or giving in. Now, as we earlier discussed, walls around ancient cities could be quite large and very strong. Now, we'll give you an example. The city of ancient Babylon had a system not of two walls, but a system of four walls. These were double walls. Now, the first inner wall was 6.5 meters thick, if you can imagine that. In other words, 6.5 meters wide. The outer wall was 3.5 meters wide. Now that's just the first set of double walls. The second set of double, double walls, the first, this, uh, excuse me, the second inner wall was seven meters thick. Seven meters. Well, that's nothing because the second outer wall was nearly eight meters thick. Now, if you can imagine a wall that big, that wide, that strong, around a city as big as Babylon was, you would come to the conclusion that nobody could successfully attack this city. Nobody. Nobody could go against the wall, enter Babylon, and take the city by force. But as students of God's Word, the Bible, what happened in 539 BCE. The doors to the walls of Babylon were left completely open and the Medes and the Persians took the city. So what's the lesson for us? Why are we focusing on this? Even though we have the availability of having the joy of Jehovah as our stronghold, even if we make it as strong as that, like a strong wall around us, how might we leave the door open, so to speak, thus allowing the attackers inside? Well, at times, a person might do what he thinks will make him happy or be successful in life. He's not thinking about Jehovah's standards. He's just thinking about what he wants to do, whether it's a university education, a job that is in some way questionable, or some other thing. No regard for Jehovah's will. 
They're thinking they can have true happiness. But here's the question. Can a person find true happiness apart from Jehovah? To find out, let's listen to another audio clip from the Nehemiah drama. Please listen closely. I heard you bind yourself with an oath and the custom to take a wife from the nations. God's law says they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. Then Jehovah's anger will blaze against you. Who are you to cancel me? Every man must find his own joy, and I intend to find mine. Ram, only Jehovah can give true joy. Do you really think you can give yourself more joy than he can? Did you hear? What did Raham say? He said, every man must find his own joy, and I intend to find mine. He was wanting to pursue a selfish course. Now that's something we want to avoid. Tempted to pursue a course that would please ourselves instead of pleasing Jehovah. But we understand that pursuing such a course only leads to frustration. In effect, it would be opening the door in our protective wall. The fact is, and just like the audio clip we just heard, we cannot give ourselves more, than Jeho more joy than Jehovah can give us, can we? That was the question asked. Only Jehovah can give true joy. Now we're confident you believe that. But sometimes it's difficult because of people around us telling us, trying to influence us to do something that is contrary to Jehovah's will. Brothers and sisters, the fact is that disregarding Jehovah's loving guidance brings harmful consequences sooner or later. For example, in our illustration of the ancient city of Babylon, her leaving the doors open led to her being losing her status as a world power. And eventually, she was completely destroyed. Today, if you were to visit Babylon, all you would see was a pile of stones, the cities in ruins. You and I, we don't want that to happen to our relationship with Jehovah. We want our relationship to Jehovah to thrive, to grow, to progress, not to be destroyed by trying to pursue selfish goals. Jehovah will not bless a decision that is not in harmony with his will. Do you recall that point from the Nehemiah drama? Let's listen. What's wrong with your children? They don't like coming to the temple. Sweetie, why don't you like it? Come back here now. I'm sorry, my lord. My wife speaks very little Hebrew. Did you not swear never to marry someone who doesn't serve Jehovah? Nehemiah, nobody cares. Eh, ah! Did you not? Yes, yes! Then why have you ignored the command of Jehovah and your own oath? Let me go! No wonder your children don't love Jehovah. Ah. Did you imagine that you could succeed without Jehovah's blessing? I prayed for Jehovah's blessing. Did you? But you didn't obey him. Rahab, how can Jehovah bless something that is against his will? Did you understand the point? Those were sad consequences of pursuing a selfish course. Their children did not love Jehovah. Then the question was asked, how can Jehovah bless something that's against his will? 
Well, the answer is, he can't. Note how the wise man Solomon put this idea in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Let's read that together. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Then I said in my heart, Come, and let me try out pleasure, and see what good comes. But look, that too was futility. I said about laughter, it is madness. And about pleasure, what use is it? What was Solomon's point? He noted that pursuing the pleasures of this world does not bring true and lasting satisfaction. Oh, it may make one happy for a time, but over a long period of time, it leaves one unfulfilled and empty. So how do we avoid this? How do we avoid this sad and empty consequence? We want to keep the door tightly shut, locked, and bolted so that no enemy can get into our wall, our joy of Jehovah. And we do that by making sure that we get to know Jehovah and Jesus more intimately. And also by following what is said in Psalm 119 and verse 66. Psalm 119, verse 66. Teach me good sense and knowledge, for I have put my trust in your commandments. Trust. We build our trust in the promises that Jehovah has given us. We trust. When he tells us not to do something, we trust him. When he tells us that we should do something, we trust him. We trust that following Jesus' example will bring us closer to Jehovah and will help us in our relationship with our fellow man. In turn, when we do those things, Jehovah's heart rejoices when we make that decision to trust him. Now you, brothers and sisters, you are to be richly commended. Through your challenges and difficulties, you have stayed close to Jehovah and to Jesus through these troubled times. Now we know it's not easy for you. We know. We know the challenges that you're facing. We know how difficult it is to put food on the table. We know how difficult it is when you're in a lockdown. We know how difficult it is when you're wondering where your next meal will come from. What will happen to your accommodation? We know. But we also know that you are standing firm and we have confidence in you that no matter what instructions come from God's organization, whatever you read in his word, the Bible, you will follow with your whole heart. Brothers and sisters, we love you. We deeply appreciate everything that you do. We know your obedience. And we thank Jehovah each and every day that we're able to serve with you. It is true. Doing Jehovah's will in these times will involve sacrifices and hardships now. But it will be a great source of joy to us both now and in the future. What have we learned? Here's our review question. How can we successfully cope with trials, discouragement, and temptation? Answer, Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10. The joy of Jehovah will strengthen and protect us. It will enable us to endure despite any challenge, any temptation, any difficulty that we may be facing. 
Can you see it? Can you see it right now? Enemies that are surrounding your wall, trying their best to break it down and attack your faith. But your wall is holding fast, no matter what weapons they're using. That wall is the joy of Jehovah. And may that joy be yours forever. Thank you, Brother Taylor, for highlighting how we can find true joy in pleasing our God, Jehovah. Now we will conclude this heartwarming assembly by standing and singing together song number 110, entitled, The Joy of Jehovah. After the song, you may have your concluding prayer at your individual locations. That's song number 110. <laughs> 